From having empty scotch bottles thrown at his head as a kid, to hunting down and finding his mom's near lethal abuser, David Feldman's rise to success with the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship has been nothing short of inspiring and unique. The Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship, also known as the BKFC, is an American bare knuckle boxing promotion based in Philadelphia. BKFC is the first promotion ever to hold an official state sanctioned and commissioned bare knuckle boxing event in the United States since 1889. Its first event was held in 2018, with 82 numbered events held as of 2024. The Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship is one of the fastest growing fight promotions in the entire world. But it wasn't always easy for David Feldman, the founder of BKFC. David Feldman's love for fighting and boxing would start at a very young age, as he was born into a three-bedroom household crammed with 10 other boxers who David's father Marty would train after work every single night. One thing that David and his father Marty shared in common was their burning desire to get things done the way they want them done. Marty would train David, his brother Damon, and these 10 other boxers every single night after hard days working at his tailor shop, and when neighbors would complain about the noise, Marty would either punch them out, shoot them with his pistol, or just blatantly tell them to fuck off. When it came to being a trainer, Marty was one of the best in the area. However, the same could not be said as being a father. David recalls it got so bad, he eventually had his own spot in the kitchen where he would be pelted by pots, pans, and whatever else David's father could get his hands on. This abuse evidently impacted David's relationship with his father and could be a big reason as to why David would kindle with his mother so well. David accredits Dawn, his mother, as to being the biggest inspiration in his entire life and what got BKFC off its feet. You see, David was only four years old when Don and his dad would split up. After the divorce, his mother sort of just disappeared, leaving David with no choice but to stay with his father in the crammed house they had for a bit. However, after one tragic night, David's life would change forever. As I said before, Don kind of disappeared out of David and his father's life after the divorce. So when she had gotten a new boyfriend, David and his father had no clue what was going on. Well, it turns out, Don's new boyfriend was extremely abusive to her, and they were able to keep this behind closed doors for a while, but after one night, Don's life will be changed forever. Driving back from the bar after what you have to assume was a very heavy drinking night, Don and her boyfriend would get into it. From what David now has heard, the two would get into it very frequently, but this night was different. This was a new level of rage from her boyfriend. He would begin beating Don, driving past a cemetery, getting out, and hitting her head against a tombstone. As her body lay limp, he would pick her up, leaving just her head out of the truck, drive on the highway, and throw her out of the car. This fall would leave Dawn paraplegic for the rest of her life. And she didn't tell David any of this until he was 14 years old. With the abusive relationship David had with his dad for those years, he would spend a lot of time with Dawn in her assisted living. It was during these times David would take heavy inspiration and admiration of his mother's grind. After contemplating suicide, Dawn would go back to school, pick up painting, and try out for the Special Olympics all with no ability to move any of her limbs. And to this day, David keeps a watercolor painting made by Don in his office. Anytime BKFC feels like it's too much or I get unmotivated, I look at that painting and think about how she used just her teeth to paint this, David says. And then I realize, quit being a pussy and work harder. Now Don's near lethal abuser would not get off scotch free. David getting filled in at 14 would begin the hunt immediately. Having just a first and last name to go by, it was an extremely tough case in Philadelphia. David even recalls it taking 22 years just to find him. One specific night while David was working as a bartender in his late 20s, a beautiful lady would walk in asking for a drink. The two would hit it off almost immediately, flirting for months on end. It took David about two months before he finally asked for her full name, and when she told him her last name, David would freeze. This was the same last name as Don's abuser from decades ago. All that grief and sadness from years and years of suffering was coming back to David in this moment. Immediately, he rushed to ask where this guy lived, and miraculously, the woman would give David the location. And in a matter of no time at all, 
David found himself with a gun in his pocket, pliers in his other, walking up to the abuser's house. David recalls having absolutely no plan of action whatsoever and just knocking on the door. When the man answered the door, David instantly asked if he knew who his mother was. The man nodded, pale as a ghost. He knew it was coming, but there was no stopping it at this point. David then tackled him to the ground. Again, having no plan at all, he decided against using the pistol. Reaching for the pliers, David then thought of a fair plan. If he was going to make other people not be able to walk, why should he? David then grabbed the man's Achilles, squeezing it with the pliers until he heard a pop. After this, David simply got up and left the house, giving the man payback for just some of the pain he had caused David and his mother. After this manhunt was finally over, David could finally turn all of his attention into becoming a fight promoter. Using his mother as a heavy inspiration, David knew he had to think outside of the box. The boxing and MMA promotions were already filled with people. David knew there was no in this way. He had to do something different. The idea would originally formulate when David would have these tough man competitions in an Indian reserve casino. You see, these tough man competitions weren't MMA or boxing, they were more like a legalized bar fight in a ring. Compared to the boxing and MMA promotions David would have, these tough man competitions blew them out of the water. Crowds loved this stuff and were packing out the casino to watch these happen. On the other side of things though, boxing promoters, boxing radios, and many more were not happy with what David was doing. Some calling it unprofessional, others calling the refs inconsistent, it seemed this was only garnering bad press. However, we know at this point David will do whatever it takes to accomplish something. And he deemed any press as good press at this time. David would take any invitation from boxing and MMA promotions and radio stations to promote his tough man competitions. He ignored all of the hate and bad press he was getting, and it was working. Bad Boy Promotions, David's first promotion company, was only garnering more and more traction. Although these tough man competitions were doing extremely well, David knew it would plateau at a point. This is when he got the idea of revitalizing a sport that hadn't been done since 1889. On a humid 100 degree night in Scottsdale, Arizona, August 2011, Bobby Gunn would take on Richard Stewart at the Yavapai Nation Reservation in the first sanctioned bare knuckle boxing match since 1889. Immediately after catching wind of this event, the Association of Boxing Commissions, the Arizona Attorney's General's Office, and even the Arizona Senator John McCain all tried to shut this down. Bobby Gunn, who was the first champion of bare knuckle fighting and also known before this as the illegal bare knuckle fighting GOAT, would get literal phone calls from the Arizona State Senator trying to get the hotel to shut fights down. Gunn and Feldman expected only about 50,000 people to tune into the live stream of their first pay-per-view event. Instead, over a million people tuned in, even crashing the fight's payment system. This was enough evidence for David Feldman to realize bare knuckle fighting was ready for the mainstream. Bobby Gunn and David Feldman had done something historic, reviving a long dead American sport, making national headlines without getting arrested, all while gaining national attention from every other combat sport. Soon after the fight in Arizona, Feldman says while in Las Vegas, he just so happened to run into Dana White, the president of the biggest MMA promotion in the world. Nice fight, Feldman recalls the UFC president telling him, but you'll never get this sport off the ground. David smiled, simply asking Dana, isn't that the same thing they told you? And Dana White's representatives have declined to comment on this. In just six years of its running, the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship is now estimated to be worth over $400 million in 2024. Not only this, former UFC champion Conor McGregor himself announced that he had become a part-time owner of the BKFC Bare Knuckle Boxing franchise earlier this year. But none of this would be possible without the determination and passion David Feldman had. What other fight promoter would step into the ring himself to keep the show going? And it's not like David just went in there to lose. He has a 4-0-1 record in his own fighting league. With more and more ex-UFC and boxers in support of the BKFC, more companies trying to buy partnerships and fit in with it, it's only a matter of time before BKFC is a legitimate threat to the UFC and Dana White. But none of this would be possible without the determination and passion David Feldman carried from his tragic childhood and past. is often associated with strength and building of the character. 
And David Feldman is a perfect example of this. So if there's anything you can take from David Feldman's rise to glory, it's that passion and determination will always beat odds stacked against you or people counting you out. David Feldman is an excellent businessman, but over everything, he is an excellent human being at the end of the day. And this wouldn't be possible without the hardships and experiences he went through as a child.